so I'm just gonna go ahead and get my workout in, my pump. I'm not in shape, really, at all, so. Ah. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Juicy. I spent most of my career traveling around the world working at some pretty cool restaurants, cooking with some crazy ingredients. But these days I spend most of my time trying to figure out how to cook delicious meals on a budget. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. I'm being challenged to prepare three delicious and affordable meals using... <laughs> yeah. And soup. We'll be making breakfast, lunch, and dinner all for less than $3 a plate. So we got three types of very basic flavored soups that we're gonna be cooking with today. They have a base of flavors that if you wanted to create that base, you need to purchase multiple ingredients. So it's a good starting point. Some cans of soup might have a lot of sodium in them, but by adding more ingredients to them, we balance that out. And that's what we're gonna show you today, how to add a few things to a can of soup to take it to that next level. Let's get started. For breakfast, we're gonna be using the old tomato bisque. And with the tomato bisque, we'll be making a croque madame, or should I say a version of a croque madame. Basically a croque madame is a fancy griddled ham and cheese sandwich with an egg on top. We'll be replacing the ham with eggplant. And some versions of the croque madame feature what is called a bechamel sauce. But today's version, instead of using milk for the bechamel sauce, we'll be using our tomato bisque. So we're gonna get this kind of like grilled cheese, tomato soup meets eggplant, parmesan meets croque madame. It's a, kind of a crazy mashup going on here. So the first thing we're gonna do for this preparation is we're gonna go ahead, cut the eggplant. So we're just slicing these into like quarter inch slabs, if you will. We have olive oil, salt, a uh, little black pepper, and garlic powder. You can season it differently if you would like. You don't want this eggplant to be too seasoned because you're gonna be adding things together. I have a tray here with a rack on it. You spread things out properly. So you'll notice that none of these things are overlapping. So now that the eggplant is lined up, we're gonna throw them into a really hot oven, like 400 degrees, 425, for about 15 minutes. While the eggplant is roasting, we're gonna get started on the bechamel sauce. So a bechamel is essentially milk thickened with a roux. What is a roux? A roux is just equal parts of flour and butter. In this case, for the bechamel, instead of milk, we're gonna be using the old tomato bisque. So we have a small pot here. Just turn the heat on, I'm gonna add my butter. I'm gonna let the butter just melt a touch before I go ahead and add the flour, otherwise the flour is going to go directly onto hot metal, which is never really a good thing. All right, so this is melted enough. It's covered the bottom of the pan. We're gonna go ahead and add the flour. Now this whole process is kind of on like low to medium heat. You don't want this scorching. The flour will burn. We're gonna be using a whisk so there aren't lumps. And then that flour right now is raw. We're gonna cook out some of that rawness in the flour before we go ahead and add the tomato soup. So we've cooked out some of that raw flour taste. Bisque is usually a soup that contains shellfish, but here we have a tomato bisque. It is just tomato and cream, no shellfish here. It's gonna whisk it when it initially goes in to prevent some of the lumps. This is a condensed soup, so we do need to add some water. Otherwise, this will be extremely thick. Usually these soups, it's one part soup, one part water. This doesn't take too long to cook, but in the time that it's cooking, you wanna stay here and whisk it. If it comes to a simmer and you're not standing here and it's thick, it's gonna be popping all over the place. It's dangerous, it's cause a mess. But other than that, it could scorch at the bottom. So it's getting very thick. Once this comes to a simmer, we can feel pretty good about that flour being cooked out. We're gonna just put it to the side and let it cool to about room temperature. This is something you could do if you wanted to the day before. And I think we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off. Put this to the side. So the basis of our croque madame, our eggplant croque madame is bread. You can toast the bread however you would like. I'm gonna be toasting it in butter because why not? We're adding butter to everything in this dish. So we're gonna continue on that trend. And this pan is pretty hot. We don't want the butter burning. I'm gonna just hold it off the heat. It's a very technical technique here. The old move the butter around in the pan with a butter knife. Learned it in culinary school. Paid a lot of money to learn that. I was just kidding. We have melted butter in our pan here. If I just go ahead and take two pieces of bread, put it in the butter once to coat the side. Now with the butter side facing up, I'm gonna start toasting the other side. This way now I have some butter ready to go on this side. All right, so both sides are toasted. With the bread toasted, we are ready to assemble the dish. So we have our eggplant, beautifully roasted, I must say. I'm just gonna cut them into strips like that. We have this sauce, we have melted cheese. We're gonna have what is pretty much a soft egg. So it's nice to have some differentiation in texture. And we're gonna get that from the eggplants. We have our bechamel that's been sitting here. 
And as you can see here, this has gotten to about room temperature. It's thickened up quite nicely. We're gonna be pretty liberal with this. You could put a little bit on, you could put a ton on. Take it all the way to the edges. Then we're gonna go ahead and add the eggplant. We're just gonna spread it out all the way to the edges. So it's a little bit like a puzzle. This is gonna be open faced, but if you wanted to put the egg in the inside and make it like, you know, breakfast sandwich situation, you could do that. It's portable. It's actually the trend of 2022. Portable eggplant croque madame innovation in its finest. All right, bechamel's on the toast, eggplant's on the bechamel. Time to put the cheese, which is the final layer prior to the eggs. So I'm using this sliced mozzarella cheese, so it's low fat, so it's kind of firm. You wanna use a cheese that melts well. We're just gonna put a couple slices on each. Now that this toast is assembled, I'm gonna go throw it under the broiler while we fry our eggs. We're sticking on theme here with the butter. I feel like with eggs, the most important thing is you're cooking an egg as the person, whoever you are feeding, prefers that egg. For the purposes of today, we are frying them sunny side up. So we will keep the yolk very running. I'm gonna season them while they're cooking. It's a little salt. The yolk is obviously a lot more dense. It is also very rich, so it can take a little more seasoning. Keeping in mind that we have seasoned everything else, we don't wanna season this too much. We're gonna put a little black pepper. So we wanna make sure our white is cooked. If you feel as though your egg white is not cooking, you can always take some of the butter from the pan and just spoon it over top the part that's not cooking. So our eggs are all set. I'm gonna go grab the croque madame out of the broiler. These are hot, so be careful. The cheese is kind of melting over the edge. That's what you want. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, put the eggs on. I'm really thinking presentation here so we can kind of still see some of the eggplant. We can see some of the bechamel on the toast and put it on your plate. All right, breakfast is served. We've got four portions of eggplant croque madame for $10.88, which comes out to $2.72 a portion. This thing is looking right. So we got some gooiness going on here. That's what we're looking for. This is gonna be messy, but I'm just gonna get in here and use my hands to eat this thing. Mm. Yeah. This is super delicious. The bechamel on top gives it that nice tangy flavor that we're looking for when we add the tomato in. This eggplant, super meaty, the cheese, and we got these pockets of crispy bits that kind of boiled on top. It's a little gooey on the outside. And then of course the yolk of the egg on top really adds some great richness. All right, it's time for lunch. We're gonna be using the good old classic cream of mushroom soup. Every time I hear about canned cream of mushroom soup, it's being added to different types of casseroles, like green bean casserole. People put cream of mushroom soup to give it a nice base. But today we're gonna keep it true to itself and serve it as a soup. But we're gonna take it like 20 levels up by adding a couple key ingredients. I will say when you open cream of mushroom soup, it doesn't jump out at you saying like, this is gonna be delicious. I won't lie, it's very thick. And you're gonna see like the smallest amount of pieces of mushroom in here. Like it looks like it was a mistake. So the recipe on the can calls for one can of soup, one can of water. So we're actually just gonna follow that. We're gonna turn the heat on, whisk this together. To make cream of mushroom soup, you're gonna have to go out and buy a variety of ingredients. It's gonna cost you a decent amount of money. So you can just go ahead and buy a can, start with that, and you're on your way to something very delicious. All right, let's get started on our portobello mushrooms. The mushrooms are very easy to process. Underneath here, these are referred to as the gills. They will add a, a very, very dark color once the soup comes in contact with it. So we're gonna go ahead and just take the gills off. There's a very, very distinct difference in texture between the gills and the rest of the mushroom, so it's not really hard to know where you're going and kind of what you're taking off. And portobello mushrooms are a great option for something like this. They make this an actual cream of mushroom soup because there really isn't much mushroom in this base that we've taken out of the can. Now that we've cleaned the gills out of the mushroom caps, we're gonna go ahead and get them ready to roast. I'm just gonna put them in this bowl. I have some olive oil and we're gonna season them with a bit of salt and pepper. We don't need to season them too much, but we do want some flavor on there. I'm gonna very delicately kind of toss these just to coat them. We wanna really keep them whole. That's the point of this. I'm gonna start them with the kind of cap side up. So with the mushrooms, we're actually gonna roast a whole head of garlic. So I'm just gonna toss this in the oil. When these mushrooms are roasting, the whole head of garlic will also roast. It will take a little more time. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the mushrooms and the garlic in the oven about 400 degrees for about 15 minutes. We'll take the mushrooms out and then we'll keep the garlic in for about another 15 minutes. So I flipped these like halfway through, so after like seven or eight minutes, our garlic is nice and soft. We're just gonna cut the top off. So you can, at this point, you can see the cloves in here. We're just gonna squeeze this out. 
To make this into a paste, we're gonna take a little bit of salt and add it to this. Salt's gonna draw out some of the moisture, which is gonna promote this becoming a paste. It's also gonna add some kind of texture to this. With the blade of the knife, drag it. And if you, you know, you can start going back and forth like that, but we wanna get it as smooth as possible. Go right into there. We wanna whisk it in. So while the soup cooks a little longer with the garlic paste in it, we're gonna move on and prepare our garnish for the soup. We have some cream, we're gonna get going right into it, so we're gonna whip it. The smaller the bowl, the harder it is to get air into the cream, which is what you're doing. So if you have a big bowl like this and a little bit of cream and a nice big whisk, you can do this pretty quickly. Now we're only gonna whisk this to what you would call soft peaks. Soft peaks basically means when you remove the whisk from the whipped cream, a peak will form and then it will fall. It doesn't stand straight up, that would be a firm peak. If the cream is very cold, it will also whip faster. And it looks like we're about there. We're gonna move on to our second garnish. Flat leaf parsley here, it's referred to as Italian parsley. I just feel like it has more flavor, so that's what we use. Stems are not only very flavorful, but they also have texture. They're crunchy and juicy like a vegetable, so it's nice to add them uh, into something like this. When we get to the part that's just stem, we're gonna stop. We don't want just stems. All right, so I think that's pretty good. Let's go ahead and cut our mushrooms. We wanna keep them substantial. All right, we are ready to plate. So we're gonna start with our mushroom. We're gonna do our best to kind of keep it together to really just show that we are serving a full cap of the portobello mushroom. I'm gonna go ahead and actually just put it right in the middle here. Our mushroom is room temperature. I'm not worried about it because the soup is like basically to a boil. I'm only pouring in one spot and I'm allowing the soup to kind of flow around. You don't need to move the soup around. It will find its way. So we're almost there. We're gonna finish the dish off with a little bit of cream, a little black pepper, and chopped parsley. Now I'm gonna put a good amount of parsley on. I just think it's delicious. And there you have it, four servings of portobello mushroom soup for $11.02, coming out to $2.75 a portion. Time to give it a taste. I am excited about the transformation of what was once this kind of glop that came out of the can. That's a weird noise. We did a few things, and now we're gonna taste it. Mm. The base of the soup has this wonderful garlic flavor from the roasted garlic. The parsley adds this nice herbaceous kind of element, makes the whole dish a little more complex. We've really elevated the value of this dish, not only just the taste. It's time for the final meal of the day, which is dinner. And we're gonna be making roasted chicken thighs with beans and kale. And for that, we're gonna be using the old uh, bean and bacon soup. It serves as a great starting point for this dish. And so of course you got white beans in it, you got bacon, there's carrots in here. It's based in this like tomato puree and then there's a variety of other seasonings that really make it this super savory punch. So this dish is gonna be like the one pot wonder situation. Everything is gonna go in this pot and then it's gonna go into the oven and it's gonna be served out of this pot. And the starting point is going to be bone-in, skin-on chicken thighs. Very inexpensive cut of meat, or they don't dry out really easily. They're easy to work with. So I first wanna go ahead and crisp up the chicken skin. We're heating the pot up. Start by adding a bit of uh, seasoning to the chicken thighs, so a bit of salt and pepper. I have a very small amount of olive oil here. We don't need to add a lot of oil because a lot of fat's gonna come off this chicken skin. I'm just gonna kinda drag the chicken skin through the oil here like this, just so it gets nice and coated, and then let it sit. I'm gonna do that with each piece. I have a nice sizzle going, we can hear it. It's not like, if you hear something really harsh like that, your pan might be a little too hot. It's really a good habit to get into when you're cooking, to listen, not just look, not just smell, but also listen to the sounds, and you get used to kind of understanding what the sound means when it's happening. Moving forward, you wanna keep the pan hot. If it gets quiet, that means your pan is cold. You risk having the skin kind of lock up on the bottom of the pan. And then let these go. Don't mess around with these. Let the fat start to come out. Let it start to crisp up. You'll start to see the edges of the skin kind of recede, getting a bit golden of the skin as well. So we're gonna go ahead and flip these. And lower the heat. Start by adding our bean and bacon soup. Bean and bacon is another one of these soups that is condensed, so it's like thick, thick. Don't get scared when you open it, because it's like, you need a spoon to get it out of here. When you eat these beans, they're gonna have a texture of a bean that you're never gonna cook at home. They're like super creamy. It's not that easy to achieve that. So we're gonna add water to this. Keep it on the side of less water. If you wanna add more, you can always do that. I'm going right over the beans. I'm not gonna pour water directly on top of the chicken skin. Obviously that would make it not so crispy anymore. Now that I've added water, 
I can turn the heat up. It's time to add the herbs and vegetables to the stew now. The first thing we're gonna add to this though is a little sprig of rosemary. Keep it whole like this, tuck it in there so it's submerged. If you don't have rosemary, not a problem. There's gonna be plenty of flavor in this stew, but it definitely adds something nice. So we've got kale here. Kale has pretty thick, big stems that we don't really wanna eat in this dish, so we're gonna just simply peel it off. So this is how you pull it apart, very easy. Just kinda pull your fingers across. And where it breaks, you might say, oh, there's a little bit of stem here. Wherever it breaks, if you're not pulling too hard, it's tender enough that it's gonna break down anyway. I'm gonna cut it up just a touch right into the pan in the areas where the stew is. With a spoon, I'm just gonna kinda work it in and it's gonna start to break down. We'll add a touch of salt to the kale. That's gonna actually start to help break it down too. Once it's like settled, the kale has settled into the liquid, we're gonna add a shallot to this. Big chunks, like this. Really treating it like a vegetable that's a component to a meal, not just something flavoring it. So I'm just gonna kinda stick these in, spread them out a little bit. And then the last addition, our lemon. We're only gonna use half a lemon. I'm just gonna take the end off and then cut these into relatively thin slices. The juice adds like this acidic kind of tanginess to a dish, but the zest and the rind add this level of complexity and floralness, similar to like an herb. It's very different. Just layer these things on here. These are gonna bake right on top. And as long as the kale, specifically the kale, has kind of sunken into the stew itself, we're ready to go into the oven at 325 degrees for about 30 minutes. All right, so our chicken and beans is out of the oven, is looking just right. So our skin's crisped up a little bit more, the kale's cooked into the stew, it's got a little caramelization on top. You see the lemons have caramelized a bit, the shallots have caramelized a bit. Everything's kind of like dried in in the best way possible. It's like a crust has almost formed on the top. Here is plating 101 with Dan Juicy. Move some of the lemon and shallot to the side, just so I can get some of the beans and kale. A nice big piece of shallot, we'll put it here. Piece of lemon, we'll take a piece of chicken now. So here it is, four portions of roasted chicken thighs with beans and kale for $11.93, coming out to $2.98 a portion. This is a hearty and delicious meal, perfect to finish off your day with. I'm excited to give this one a try. I will be eating it with the elusive combo of knife and spoon. I think that is appropriate here. Mmm. That is a far cry from what came out of the can. Because we kept the shallot whole, and it's in these big rings. It has texture, it's juicy still when you eat it. Not every bite tastes exactly the same, which is great and keeps it really interesting. So a super balanced meal. We have our protein, but we have a ton of vegetables in here as well. And to think that you can make a meal that looks like this and tastes like this for less than $3 is pretty cool. And there you have it, three simple recipes that turn ordinary cans of soup into so much more. Although sometimes canned soup can get a bad rap, it's a great base to elevate. So next time you're at the supermarket, do not overlook the canned soup aisle because it's extremely affordable and very versatile. You know, I'm supposed to just taste this and comment on it, but I keep nibbling at it, you can't stop eating it. It's like super savory and super delicious. Probably gonna finish this one. Yeah, you guys just hang out there. I'm just gonna continue to eat here, if you don't mind.